Okay, good. Let me share screen. Okay. Okay. okay, so the goal today is to learn how networks can implement what's called associative memory or content addressable memory. And that's the kind of memory that, that humans and presumably animals have. So you remember part of a scene and the whole thing comes flooding back. Like I said earlier, you see a tail of a dog, you can recall the whole dog. You see, or you even hear a person's name, you can recall the whole person. And the way we picture that happening, um, so if this is activity space, Okay, um, so this would be, well, this is really high dimensional, but this might be the firing rate of neuron one, the firing rate of neuron two, the firing rate of neuron three. And of course, there are millions of other axes so it's a really high dimensional space. And remember, the firing rates evolve in time. We saw that earlier um, in kind of non-trivial ways, but we wanna choose connectivity and single neuron properties so that under network dynamic, um, if we, for instance, started here, we would go to a fixed point. Okay. And the fixed point is just some point in activity space where neurons fire without any inputs. Um, so you start somewhere else, you might end up a different fixed point. And each fixed point corresponds to some pattern of activity. So for instance, um, if you look at activity of R1, R2, R3, so R1, R2, R3. So this fixed point here, this one here has R1 and R3 kind of large and R2 kind of small, okay? So it's mainly in our one R3 space. And in fact, we can even see that, make this more realistic. We can even see that R1 is a little bit smaller than R3, okay? So that's this fixed point. Whereas a different fixed point, let's say this one, would have R1 and R2 both kind of big and R3 small, okay? And the idea is, is each of these fixed points, so this might correspond, this one might correspond to a dog, this one might correspond to your friend. And the idea is the rest of the brain rest of the brain interprets these firing rates, can interpret these patterns of activity. These patterns of activity. Okay. So if the rest of the brain saw that, that um, you know, saw the green pattern of activity where R1 is sort of intermediate rate, R2 is quiet, R3 is, is at high rate, and say, oh, that's our friend, okay? Um, We saw this other pattern of activity where R1 and R2 are kind of high and R3 is low, I'd say, oh, it's a dog, okay? So what we wanna do is, is write down um, 
So we want to make up network connectivity that's going to give us these fixed points. And the goal is to, is the goal is to really, so the goal, explain human level memory. Okay. So humans can remember tens of thousands of items. I mean, you could just, a, a typical vocabulary is 20 to 50,000 words, I believe. And that's 20 to 50,000 words per language. So you guys who speak both Chinese um, and English know twice as many words as I do. Um, and they're stored somehow in your brain, presumably in the weights, okay? Um, so this is really our goal for the day. We want to understand how this can happen. And we're going to do it in stages. One, we're going to look at a classical hop field network. Which I think I mentioned a little bit last time. Or maybe not. So it's a network with, um, it's a network that actually has these fixed points and you can, you can, you can really interpret them. Um, then we're gonna look sort of look at um, a version of that, which is sparsely connected. And I'll say what that means in a second. Okay. And, and basically that's gonna understand, it's gonna allow us to understand how networks can have this property, but then we're gonna take sort of a deeper look at this. So basically what I'm gonna do is give you um, sort of associated memory networks. Okay, so what the classical hot wheel, what here I'm just basically gonna write down a prescription for a network. It's gonna look like it kind of comes out of the blue. And what we're gonna do in this part is try to figure out, you know, where this came from and why these networks had this particular form and also what this has to do with computing in general. Um, this lecture is gonna be pretty hard, not because the material is especially hard, but it's going to be, I'm guessing, very, very unfamiliar. So I really want you to stop me um, if something doesn't make sense. I'll try to be as clear as possible, but without feedback, um, I'll probably go a little bit too fast. Okay. So start with the classical hot field network. Um, it's not gonna, I think I wrote it down the dynamic, dynamics last time. It's not gonna look exactly like a network. It's gonna look a little strange or the, the networks we've seen before. Um, okay, it's gonna have this dynamic. So SI, it's a really, really simple dynamics, T plus one equals sign of the sum on j of jij sj at t, okay? So we can think of this as synaptic drive. I mean, you know, very loosely. I mean, the only relation is, is there's a sum, this is synaptic drive. And um, when synaptic drive, we'll call this HI. So when HI is bigger than zero, neuron fires, fires, which means that um, SI of T plus one, equals plus one, and when HI is less than zero, neuron is silent, and again, silent means SI of T plus one. Okay, 
So it's kind of like a real neuron. It, you know, if it gets enough input, it fires. Otherwise, it's silent. Um, but it's very, very, it's somewhat artificial. Okay, we can take the time set to be 10 milliseconds. So it seems kind of like a synaptic drive. So it's, but it's a really, really, really reduced model of a neuron. And reduced models are kind of nice because they're analytically solvable. Um, so I don't know if you've noticed this in your physics class. Physicists are famous for writing down problems they can solve and crossing their fingers and hoping they have something to do with reality. Um, and when Huffield model first came out in the 1980s, early 1980s, all the neuroscientists said this has nothing to do with real neurons. Um, but since then, then that's all been fixed and Huffield models can be implemented in networks of spiky neurons. Um, so conceptually, the idea was really great, um, but this early version is, is really a reduced model. Okay, so what's important about the Hopfield model is a connectivity. And I don't know John Hop where John Hopfield dreamed this up. Um, stroke of genius, smart guy, something he knew from his past. But we're gonna set JIJ equals um, the sum on mu of squiggle I mu squiggle J. Actually, I'm not going to use squiggle. In fact, um, one over N. By the way, the sum here is J equals one to N. So we have N neurons. Oops. So it's one over N. Um, the sum mu equals one to P of squiggle I mu, squiggle J mu. Where squiggle I mu equals plus one with probability half and minus one with probability one half. Okay, so this is a random binary vector. Okay, um, and so what we're going to show is with this kind of connectivity, um, with these with these sort of random random vectors, um, random binary vectors, that's actually going to give us the kind of memory network um, we saw on the previous page. Okay, it's going to give us exactly this kind of dynamics. It's got fixed points. Um, and in fact, the fixed points are easy to write down, okay? So what we're gonna do is basically, we're gonna take this connectivity and put it in here, okay? Um, and in fact, I'm gonna do this on this page so it'll be easier to see. Um, so the sum on J of J I J S J of T equals um, the sum on J of one over N, the sum on mu of squiggle I mu, Squiggle J mu S J of T. And we can write this as a sum on mu of squiggle I mu. Oh, shoot, I did not want to use squiggles. Let me fix that right now. The reason is I reserve squiggles for noise. So I'm going to use eta. Okay, sum on mu of a di mu times one over n, the sum on j of a to j mu s j of t. Okay, 
Um, so, okay. So we're going to take take this term here and put it inside here and get our update equation. Okay. So what we have is um, SI of T plus one equals sine of sum on mu of eta i mu times one over n, the sum on j of eta j mu s j of t. Okay? So, so Hoffield presumably, I don't know why he wrote this down, but once he wrote this down, he stared at it and he saw really the key quantity is this term right here, okay? And one thing you notice about this is, um, so this is big, so this term here, so it's big when um, Sj of t equals um, a to j mu, also a to j nu, um, the, the, uh, the mu equals nu term The mu equals new term is big when SJT equals A to J nu. Okay, so let's, and then the other terms are small. And we'll see that explicitly in a second. So if you use the thing of sort of sums of random variables, that'll make a lot of sense. Um, if not, it'll make sense in just a second. So here's our guess. So basically, this is a this is a complicated equation, right? N can be large, um, so it's you know this is in some sense N can be a million. This can be a million equations, a million unknowns, and we want to find the fixed points. So goal, find fixed points. Okay. Um, and our guess for a fixed point a fixed point is that um, SJT equals well equals a to j nu. So this is a guess. Okay. What we're going to do now is plug it back into the equation and see if it's correct. Okay. So if it's correct, so basically we have a to j nu equals, and we'll put a question mark here because we don't know if this is gonna happen. Sine. So we're gonna split this into what's called signal to, into noise, okay? Um, so we're gonna break out the i a to i nu term, and then we have one over n the sum on j, of a to j nu times a to j nu, right? Because sj is a to j nu plus the sum mu not equal to nu of a to i mu. Um, and then we have, we'll put the one over and out here, sum on a to n j of a to j mu, um, a to J new. Okay. And this term, of course, is just, oops. This term here is equal to one. So we have A to J new. And again, we'll put a question mark here. We have sine. Oops, that should be a.
Let's do some I. Sine A to I nu plus, I'm going to call this squiggle I. And squiggle I equals one over N, the sum over mu not equal to nu and J of eta I mu, eta J mu, eta J nu. Okay. And squiggle I, so remember these quantities here, these are totally random variables, all right? They're just, they're just plus or minus one with probability a half, okay? So this quantity here, it really is a noise term. It's completely random under our guess. Um, and so we can ask, how big is it? So how big is this term? How big? Um, and its mean is zero, right? Because these quantities here are plus, plus or minus one. So all these quantities here, they're independent and they're plus or minus one. Okay. So we're adding up. So how many terms in the sum? So this is the sum, this sum here. Sum has um, P minus one times N terms. Okay, each of which um, term is plus one or minus one. Okay, so we're adding up a large sum with either plus one or minus sum one. And you can think of these as coin flips, the newly variables. Um, Anyway, you want to think about it, but we can see how big it is on average. So we can actually sort of drop the, the thing. We can, we can just compute this sum. The sum, uh, let's say a sum on, what shall I use? Sum on K equals one to N times P minus one of ZK. And this is plus or minus one. Call this just, uh, I don't know, call it X. So the mean value of X, the mean value of X of course is zero, All right? What's X squared? So this is the sum on K and K prime, ZK, ZK prime averaged, so this is zero if K is not equal to K prime, okay? Because they're independent. So this equals the sum on K of the average value of ZK squared. And the average value of ZK squared is the easiest thing in the world. Because Z, if ZK is plus or minus one, ZK is squared is, is equal to one. So this equals um, N times P minus one. So this variable X, um, is basically equal to square root of n p minus one times sort of overusing this thing um, times some uh, I don't know call it z where this is actually Gaussian so p of z equals e to the minus z squared over two over two pi. So this is exactly the same calculation I did several lectures ago. Um, and it's a usual thing. If you have a sum of a large number of, of independent random variables, um, the size of that sum scales is square root of the number of terms in the sum. So that means squiggle i, squiggle i, which we can see up here, it depends on i, right? So each, each squiggle i is going to be different. Um, so squiggle i is going to equal the square root of n p minus 1. We have to divide by n. We divide by n because of the 1 over n here times zi. 
Oops. Uh oh. I accidentally deleted a page. No, I just, uh, there we go. Apparently I accidentally deleted something. Okay. Oh yeah, squiggle I equals um, that times a ZI equals the square root of P minus one over N times ZI, where ZI is just a Gaussian random variable, the zero mean unit variance. Okay, so let's go back to this picture here, um, this equation here. Okay, um, which I'll copy down here. Um, a to I new again, we have a question mark equals sine of A to I new plus squiggle I. And squiggle I is this Gaussian variable um, with standard deviation squared to P minus one over N. So the picture here for the term inside this axis, so we're gonna put the squiggle, sort of the, the A to axis here, this is zero minus one plus one. So the term inside this term, its mean is, is if, if, if a to i nu equals one, um, if a to i nu equals one, then it's got some distribution around here. And the width of that distribution is a square root of P minus one over N. And the same over here. If A to I nu has to be equal minus one, the width is gonna be, again, the square root of P minus one over N, okay? And so what we want, we want sort of the, what we, um, if this is to, if this equation for this equation to be satisfied, what we need is that um, sort of what we need is is a to i so satisfied if um, a to i new plus squiggle i has the same sign. as a to i nu, okay? Um, and that, that happens when, that's the same thing as saying that squiggle i is less than one, okay? Um, actually, it's, it's, it's really, well, in, so if squiggle i is less than one, that's guaranteed to happen, okay? It's not quite the same, but, we're going to lesson one's a little stronger. Um, and so the typical, and basically, so squiggle line, so this is satisfied if P is much less than N, okay? So if P over N, if, if standard deviation is 0 0.1, then for this to be violated, um, you have to have a 10 standard deviation outlier. Okay, so P less than N, we could have P over N equal, or P minus one over N equals 0 0.1. And this is gonna be satisfied with very, very high probability. Okay. Um, so this is super nice. So in some sense, um, if P, if, you know, P minus one over N is less than, let's say 0 0.1, um, we found fixed points. Okay, um, 
And so this is kind of nice. What this tells us, and, and we know exactly what the fixed points are. The fixed points are, um, where did our guess go? So this is our guess, right? This is our guess for the fixed points. So not only do we know how many they are, but we know exactly what they are. So Homfield chose a connectivity, um, connectivity matrix, a JIJ that gave dynamics that gave him fixed points. Um, it's not, uh, question? So it's not really, um, I don't know, ideal way to do neuroscience because it, it involves you know, this incredible insight um, there was computation we wanted the network to do, and Hopfield just dreamed up a connectivity that gave him that. Um, I guess if you've been thinking about these things for a long time, it's, 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 it's in some sense kind of obvious. Um, and so, so this is really, this is a classical Hopfield network. Now, there are a couple twists to this. Um, so first of all, it turns out, turns out, that's actually, So it turns out so if you if p is less than 0 0.138 n uh, you can embed well you can embed p memory so you can embed p, p fixed points p fixed points and think of a fixed point as a memory. So this is really a memory. So it's a fixed point of dynamics. It's something you can store in your brain. Uh, once you go to that fixed point, um, your, your brain can figure out, oh, that's a dog, that's a cat, that's my friend. Um, so it's really, really convenient way to store things. And so, if, and also, you know, N equals 10 million, 10 to the seventh is, is that's actually kind of a small network. Um, for humans. Okay, so we have 10 to the 10th neurons. So this is, you know, this is 10 to the seventh. We have 10 to the 10th neurons. So that's one one thousandths, one one thousandths of our brain. Okay, so that's really nice. It's one one thousandth of the brain you can store, you know, if you want, you can store a million things, which is plenty. And if you want to store more, you just use a few more neurons. Um, you know, 1% of your brain, you could store um, well, 10 million things. So this is, this was really, so people were pretty excited about this. So this is exciting because, um, you know, understanding where we store memories seems pretty critical in understanding how the brain works, okay? So that's the good news. The bad news, so I, I'm gonna tell you the bad news in a second. So that's, we'll stick with the good news. But what we want to do is get a little more insight into what's going on. So what's really going on? So I just did a bunch of math. Is there some intuitive picture we can look at um, that will give us sort of an idea of, of what all this means? And there is. So let's go to the next page. Um, so we're going to think of, of this as our network of neurons. So this is, you know, network of neurons. And what I'm going to do is divide into two regions, into two regions. So all the neurons up here. So for these neurons, A to I nu equals plus one. And for these neurons, eta i nu equals minus one. 
Okay. So um, what we're going to do is now set, suppose SI equals plus one up here and SI equals minus one down here. Okay. So if we only consider, so remember the connectivity matrix JIJ is equal to one over N eta I nu, eta J nu plus one over N to some mu not equal to nu of eta I nu, eta J. Eta J, okay? So let's focus first on, on this term. So we're, let's forget about, forget about this term and focus only on this term, okay? Um, in that case, if your neuron up here, so if you're sitting here, you're some kind of neuron, if you look at two neurons, the connection strength from here to here is positive. Okay. And because this neuron has positive, this neuron is positive because it's SI is set to one plus one in here, these neurons are going to reinforce each other. The connection from here to here is negative, but there's a minus one down here. Okay. So minus one times minus is plus. So this is heavily reinforcing all the plus neurons. Um, are making this, trying to make this plus, all the minus neurons are trying to make this plus as well. Okay. Oh no. Oh. Okay. Okay, so let's put this back. So this connection is minus, but there's a minus one here, okay? So again, the plus neurons are trying to make this neuron active, the minus ones are trying to make this neuron active. And the same thing is happening down here. So the connection from here to here is plus, right? Because A to I nu and A to J nu, so we'll call this, call this neuron I, call this neuron J, Call this neuron K, call this neuron L. So A to K nu and A to L nu are both negative. Their product is positive, and so this is plus. Okay. And also this is uh, minus, but there's a minus, there's a plus one here. Okay. So sorry. This connection here is plus. Um, it's coming from a neuron of sinus minus one, so the net result is negative. So it keeps that neuron negative. Here, um, the connection strength is minus, but it's coming from a plus, it keeps this negative. So everything's fine. Everything is reinforcing um, this, sort of reinforcing this solution with a plus one here and a minus one here. So what about this term? What does it do? So um, it's basically, you know, each of these terms from the point of view of, so now look at this term, we'll call it, uh, let's go, oops. So we'll have this be orange, okay? Um, so we'll think of this as an orange, the orange connections. Um, so this is a sum of a bunch of random variables. It's neither neither plus one or minus one. It's sort of it's so this is um, this term here is again the square root of p over p minus one over n times some random variable. Okay, and so sometimes so the orange term, if you're looking from here to here, the orange contribution, let's say from here to here. So this one might be plus. Um, and this one over here is just as likely to be minus as plus. So it, it contributes on average nothing. On average, this contribution from, from this piece of the connectivity is zero, but of course its variance isn't zero, right? 
um, it's it's sort of as as you have more and more memories, um, this term gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if P is on the order of n, it can actually push the neurons away. Okay. So the idea, this idea, so there's a couple things that went on here that allowed us to, to really do this. So, so there were sort of two important features of the hot field connectivity. So one, so remember JIJ um, equals one over N, the sum on mu of squiggle I mu, squiggle J mu equals one to P. So what are the key features of this? So one is, so one is low rank, okay? Which basically means P, oops, what's going on? A low rank means P less than N. So details, if you know about linear algebra, you know what low rank is, it doesn't really matter, but P is less than N. And the other is that squiggle, mu dot squiggle nu is approximately mm -hmm. equal to zero. It's certainly zero on average. Okay. So these, these sort of, you can think of this, one way to write this is, so these are vectors. So squiggle mu equals squiggle one mu. Man, I should have, it should have been atus. So eta um, so eta mu dot eta nu um, when nu is not equal to mu. And these are just vectors. So this is eta one mu, eta two mu. Okay. Um, they weren't zero on average, and, and because they weren't zero on average is really why um, there's a small amount of interference. If you made these exactly orthogonal and binary, um, then you can store n memories, but that's kind of um, a fine tuning problem. Okay. Okay, so to summarize, it's really, you know, we use this low rank structure or the sort of semi orthogonal structure. Um, two things are important, P has to be less than n, and these things have to be approximately orthogonal. Um, those are the two ingredients you had, and that, that allowed um, oops, went too far. So that allowed um, these terms here to be so the blue ones to be self-reinforcing. Um, and that's basically because we chose these to be binary, but that's a little bit of a detail. Um, and it allowed the orange terms to be zero on average. But if you have too many memories, those zeros on average add up, you get too big a noise term and you kill the memory. Okay. Um, okay. And it, and you know we chose these to be binary. Um, these are plus or minus one. But as we'll see later, that's a bit of a detail. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is the low rank and the near orthogonality. Okay. Um, it's convenient if they're plus or minus one, but it's not necessary. Um, really, what you want is, yeah, all you all you care about is is these two terms. So these are the important things: low rank, near orthogonality. Okay. Okay, so that's that's the basic idea. We're gonna see this in a couple more examples, but first I wanna tell you the bad news. Okay, so bad news. So the good news is it looks like we've have at least a candidate not model for memory. The bad news is, um, so we assumed all to all connectivity. Uh, 
Okay, if you look at our, our um, the weight matrix, right? Every single neuron is connected to every single neuron. JIJ is non-zero for every single I and J. So in the brain, in the brain, neurons are sparsely connected. Sparsely connected. Connected. So they get um, input from from approximately. So we saw this in previous lectures. One thousand other neurons. Okay. Um, so we'll assume that you know. Um, we'll assume so. Assume k. Assume k inputs. So k inputs on average. So k is sort of on the order of thousand. And the question we want to ask is, you know, how many memories can we store? Okay, when we reduce connectivity from all to all to only k neurons, does the capacity go up? Does it go down? How does it change? So we'll do that calculation and then we'll take a break. Um, and this is, um, this is kind of important. So we have SI, right? SI of T plus one equals, um, again, the sign. We'll pick the same model of the sum on J of Jij, Cij, Sj of T. Um, where Cij equals one with probability K. Of k over n, when this is j equals one to n, and zero with probability one minus k over n. Okay, so basically that ensures on average you'll have k connections per neuron. There'll be some variation, but but that's what you get on average. Um, and we're going to let JIJ be a little bit different. We're going to just scale it. So JIJ is equal to one over K. The sum on mu again equals one to P of eta, eta I mu, eta J mu. And again, these are plus or minus one with probability one half. Okay, so the A haven't changed. The J is pretty much the same. We scaled it at one over K. It doesn't really matter because we're taking the sign, but it just makes things convenient. Okay, so again, we're gonna write um, SI. We're gonna basically do the same analysis and, 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 but the noise is gonna be a little bit different. SI of T plus one equals sine. And now we have one over k outside, the sum on j of c i j, we'll put the c i j first, the sum on mu of eta i mu, eta j mu, s j of t. And we're going to write that as before as sine of um, the sum on mu. A to I mu times one over K, uh, the sum on J of C I J, A to J mu, S J of T. 
okay? Same as before, we just have a, a CIJ in there, and then we're gonna make the same guess. S I of T equals eta I nu. The same guess for the fixed point. And now we get eta I nu is equal to sine of eta I nu times one over K, the sum on J of C I J and eta j mu again squared, sorry. Mu squared plus the sum mu not equal to nu of eta i mu the sum on j of c i j eta j mu eta j mu. So again, we have a signal term and we have a noise term. Okay. Um, we want to work out what they are. The signal is kind of easy. So first of all, um, you kind of can't see that. Remember this is nu um, j squared. So this term here is just equal to one. Nu j is plus or minus one. So the signal term is pretty easy. So the signal is equal to um, eta i nu times one over k, the sum on j of Cij, okay? And this quantity here is one on average. Um, and we wanna know, it's not exactly one, and we wanna work out the noise. So there's some noise in this one as well. Um, so we can ask how big is that? So this is basically one over K, uh, the sum on J, equals one to N of Cij equals one over K, the sum J equals one to N of Cij minus K over N, the average value of Cij plus uh, one over K, the sum J equals one to N of K over N. And this term of course is just equal to one. That's the on average term. And this term, these are a bunch of independent theory mean random variables. So the variance of this term here is equal to one over K squared, the sum J equals one to N of the average value of C I J minus K over N squared. And this quantity here with probability k over n, this equals one minus k over n squared. And with probably one minus k over n, it equals minus k over n squared. When you work that out, this is k over n, one minus k over n times one minus k over n plus k over n equals k over n, one minus k over n. So the sum, the sum, um, when you plug this thing back into the sum, you get uh, one over n k, one minus k over n. This looks wrong to me. Um, oh, times n. So the factor of n comes from the sum, the factor of nk, let's be a little more careful. So we have one over k squared, one over k squared, 
we have a factor of n from the sum, and then we have k over n, one minus k over n, and the n's cancel, and this e is equal to one minus k over n divided by k, okay? So the signal is equal to one plus the square root of one minus k over n divided by k times some, uh, call it squiggle new. So this is a, a zero mean unit variance. It's actually a random variable, it's actually Gaussian, but we don't care about that. Okay. So the signal is, is, is pretty much one on average with some fluctuations. What about the noise? Okay. So the noise, we're adding up. So let's look at the noise now. So the noise, um, go back to what it was, it's, And we're missing a one over K. So the noise is one over K. Let's have a look at it. It's pretty much the same as before. The sum mu not equal to nu and J of eta I mu eta j nu, eta j nu, and now there's a cij term here, okay? And so this again has um, n p minus one terms, okay? Um, and the average, so variance of the noise is one over k squared, the sum on mu not equal to nu and j of everything squared, eta i mu, eta j mu, eta j nu, cij squared. Um, this is equal to one over k squared, the sum mu not equal to nu, the sum on j of just uh, cij. So Cij squared is equal to Cij, um, and this is equal to one over K squared times N P minus one times the average value of, of this is this K over N. Um, so the N's cancel, one of the K's cancel, and we get um, equals P minus one over K. So the noise um, equals P minus one over K to the square root times squiggle. And this is a zero mean unit variance. random variable, which happens to be Gaussian, okay? So if we go back to this equation here, um, the signal is basically, the signal is basically one plus a little bit of noise, small noise, The signal is just this piece, and the noise is is square root of p minus one over k squiggle. Okay, so let's now make the same plot as before. Um, so we have so eta i nu equals and again a question mark sine of eta i nu times one plus 
Uh, how big was that term? One plus the square root of one minus k over n over k times a to nu. Oops. And squiggle I knew. And then plus the square root of P minus one over K squiggle I. So it's very similar to what we had before, except we used to have a, an N here, now we have a K. Okay. And that changes things by a lot. Again, we're going to plot, we're going to plot this term here. So here's zero, here's minus one, here's plus one. Um, so we have two noise terms. This noise term is actually, this term is actually very small. This case is one over root K, which we can ignore. It's one, one part in 30, we can ignore that. Um, but this term here is potentially big, okay? So again, we have um, two distributions red and this one and this one here here and the width of these are the square root of p minus one over k so now we need p minus one over k so we need p much less than k so p over k you know equals maybe 0 0.1 should be okay because now then uh, we need to go 10 standard deviations to get a bit flip. Um, and what that means is P equals capacity on approximately equal to 0 0.1 times K, which is approximately equal to 100. Oops. Okay, so it doesn't matter how big N is, you can only store about a hundred memories if you have this sparse connectivity. And so this was a bit of a blow to, um, a bit of a blow to, to hot field networks. Um, there were various attempts to fix it, but currently, Currently, well, until recently, let's be a little more accurate. So until recently, um, there were no fixes. Okay, so until recently, we had no idea how to um, store multiple memories. So recently there have been some, there have been some very speculative models to in, very speculative ways to increase the capacity. Um, none of them have been yet implemented in networks of neurons. So in networks of spiky neurons, so these references are on, on the web. My page networks of spiky neurons, So the record is approximately 50 memories. And it's a pretty large network, uh, by 50, 60,000 um, neurons. So what this means is we actually have no idea how memory stored in the brain. Um, it's a pretty important and ongoing um, area of research. Well, kind of, a, it's pretty important area of research, but nobody works on it anymore because nobody knows what to do. Um, so it's a little challenge for you guys in the future. Um, and so you might wonder, you know, given that the Hoffield network is kind of dead, why study it? And the answer is the analysis we use is extremely important and it comes up all the time. And it does provide some insight. I mean, if you can do some analysis and rule something out, in many ways, that's more useful than ruling it in. Um, 
if you've been around neuroscience for a while, there are tons and tons of, of models that we haven't rolled out, but very few that we have. So this is kind of nice. Okay, so let's take a little break. And in the um, what I'm going to do in the next part is talk about at least a little deeper look at the signal and noise analysis. Um, and hopefully the idea is the more you see it, the more it'll sink in, because it really is it's super important. Okay, I'll take a five-minute break. Feel free to ask any questions.
Okay, so let's. Um, what we're going to do now is is take a closer look at um, this. It's called self consistent signal to noise analysis, and it's it's really it's a really really important technique. Um, first, we're going to consider um, we're going to consider what happens in, and we're going to soften the Hopfield model. Um, we're going to go back to all teleconnectivity, and then after that, we're going to consider um, we're going to if we have time, we're going to couple the Hopfield model to to um, sort of background connectivity. So here's what I mean by soften Hopfield model. So the SI of t plus one um, equal instead of a, a sine function, we use a hyperbolic tangent. Tanch. I'm going to put a beta in here, the sum on j of j i j, s j of t. Um, and j i j is going to be as usual, uh, 1 over n, the sum on mu of a to i mu, beta j mu. OK, when we do it this, this way, we'll actually get additional insight into what's going on. Um, and tanch. So if the difference between tangent and step function or sine, so if this is zero, um, so this is sine, the sine function, and then this is, of course, the tangent function. And how steep it is depends on beta. So steepness. Depends on beta. On beta, and beta goes to infinity. Uh, gives a sign. Gives a sign again. Okay, so in some sense, we can extrapolate between sort of you know small beta, which is really shallow, and c beta, which is um, where beta goes to infinity, which is the, the, the sign again. Okay. And so as usual, we just write SI of t plus one in the usual way, SI of t plus one equals tanch of beta times the sum on mu of eta i mu times one over n the sum on j of eta j mu s j of t okay now remember in a previous one so previously so guess we guess that s i equals a to i and a. okay we can't do that anymore because um Tanch is never quite plus or minus one. So SI is going to be, can't be exactly eight I nu. But we can now, so guess that SI is sort of proportional eight I nu. And that should be taken with a grain of salt. And what we're going to do is, is, is write down the overlap. And find the overlap. So overlap. So m mu is equal to one over n the sum on j of eta j mu s j of t. So m mu is now a function of t. Okay. So. If S J of T is is sort of close to A to J, so this thing is is so it's one at most. So one 
for a complete overlap, And then um, it's approximately zero for no overlap. But of course, it's not quite zero. So even if, if you know, SJ is random relative to A to J, um, let's say SJ is, you know, A to J nu and, and nu is not equal to mu, we know this sum is going to be sort of some random variable, okay? And that's really what I want you to take home. Sums of zero mean var um, variables aren't zero. They're zero on average, but they're not quite, okay? So when we do that, we get that SI of T is equal to tanch beta So the sum on i of eta i mu m mu. Okay. So we go back here, remember that that this quantity here, this quantity here, oops. I don't know why it does that. This quantity here is just m mu. Okay, from the definition down here. And now what we're going to do is write down a self-consistent equation for m nu. So write m nu So m nu oops m nu is equal to 1 over n the sum on j of eta j nu, so this is m nu evaluated times t plus one, um, sj of t. And for sj of t, we'll just use, we'll just use this term. Um, so this is equal to one over n, the sum on j, of eta j nu tanch of beta. And this should be sum on sum on mu. Okay. Um, Beta, the sum on mu, eta, j mu, m mu, of t. So m mu of t plus one. Okay. So this is now. So we've 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 things have gotten better. We used to have n equations for n unknowns. Now we have a p equations. Right, there are only p values of uh, p overlaps, um, and so we have an equation for these these p overlaps, um, which is kind of nice. We re reduced it, but it's a weird looking equation. Okay, because all we have these these strange sums over j. It's not the equations we're used to. Um, but we're going to use the usual thing we do: one over n the sum on j of eta. J nu tanch. So beta, we're going to break this up. We're going to write a to j nu, m nu of t plus beta times the sum nu not equal to mu. Oops. Mu. Oops. Mu not equal to nu of eta j mu 
m eta t. Okay. And so if so, so here's the idea. Um, okay, the other thing we can do, so we know the following. So plus or minus one times tanch of z, because tanch is an odd function equals plus equal tanch of plus or minus z. Okay. So we're going to use that to take this a to j nu and take it inside because a to j nu is just plus or minus one. So this is equal to one over n, the sum on j of tanch. You got beta m nu plus beta, the sum mu not equal to nu of eta j nu, eta j mu, m mu of t. Okay. So again, this looks like signal and this looks like noise. Okay. So let's, as a first pass of figuring out what is going on, so we assume, as usual, the noise is going to be small. Um, but as a first pass, ignore the noise. And that's super nice because it gives us the equation that. So this term just goes away, it's gone. All right, let me ignore the noise. Um, so we can write m nu at t plus one is equal to one over n, the sum on j of tanch beta, m nu of t, um, j equals one to n, and the right-hand side doesn't depend on j. So this is just equal to tanch beta m nu of t. Okay? So we have a really, really nice equation, which we can solve as usual for nonlinear equations. We saw the graph. So I'm gonna rewrite it here m nu equals tanch beta m nu of t so this is m nu of t plus one um and so how do we solve this so basically this is called an iterated map so this is um i'll call it m nu space and we write, we draw a tanch like this. And oops. Um, close up. This is plus one, this is minus one. We're gonna also get it going to draw a um, 45 degree line. Okay. And what that means now is if basically, let's say this is um, m nu of t, to find m nu of t plus one, we go up to here. So this is gonna be m nu of t plus one, and then uh, that's there. And then basically, this becomes, because that's the significance for a five, five degree line, this is m nu of t plus one. And then we go up. And this is m nu of t plus two. And we just keep going up and over, up and over, up and over until we end up at a fixed point. Okay. And no matter how close we start to here, we'll eventually move away. So we have two fixed points at 
you know, here and here. Um, and what's critical for these two to be a slit, the fixed points, what we need is that, so, so we have fixed points near plus or minus one if the slope at zero is greater than one. So we need a slope, so DD bait, we need DDM of tanch beta M evaluated at M equals zero greater than one. Um, and for basically the slope at, at small beta, so that's the same as uh, beta greater than one. So as long as beta is greater than one, we can embed a memory in the, in the zero noise limit. Um, and the memory can be you know, either positive or negative. Um, for a weird feature of the Huffield network that goes away in more, more realistic models. And we can also, you know, we can ask what happens when um, when beta, oops, when beta is less than one. Um, so we'll put the forty-five degree line that goes here. Get the right color code. Um, and then, so beta less than one goes like this. So this is beta less than one. And now you can't have a memory. Okay, so if you start, if you start here at M of T, M nu of T, you go up, over, down, over, down. And the only fixed point is fixed point zero. That M, M new. Okay, so kind of makes sense. You need a cut. You need a strong nonlinearity if you're going to have memory. Okay, and, and the limit that the big of infinity would basically get a flip flop. Um, in the in the zero noise limit. Okay, so now as usual. So what we want to do now is really deeply understand the role of noise. Okay, so we're going to go back to this equation. Um, this one here, which I'll copy over. Okay, we're gonna go back to this equation and now we're gonna include the noise. And we're gonna ask how big is the noise? Okay, so first of all, actually I need a, oops. So this is M nu of T plus one. Okay. So what's M nu, remember? So M nu is one over N, the sum on uh, J of eta J mu S J of T. Okay. So now actually, if you want to do things rigorously, it gets really hard. But if so if M nu is large, then SJ, SJ of T, SJ of T is approximately aligned with um, A to I nu. So at SJ of T is approximately independent
Um, hey there, Jamie. Okay. So we have the sum of n. We have the sum of n independent variables. So the size of this thing is in the order of one over root n. Okay. Um, so each of these mu has one over root n, and now we have so we have so mu scales as one over root n for mu not equal to nu, and therefore the sum mu not equal to nu of eta j mu eta j sorry nu eta j mu. Um, mu. So there are p minus one terms in the sum. So this goes as root p minus one, the square root of p minus one, and divided by n. Okay, and then times some random variable. Okay, so the noise term has the same form as before. We've seen this already. Square root of p minus one over n squared of i, and I'm going to stop here, but what we want to do now is take a close look at what this does to our gain functions. Okay, to understand how the gain functions affect um, this curve, or how the noise, sorry, how the noise affects that curve. Okay, and that's what we're going to do next time, um, and then we'll finish up with with upfield networks, and we we'll talk about um, line attraction networks. But we're going to go back to these low rank connectivity. I mean, it turns out to be sort of increasingly inter playing an increasingly interesting role um, in models of the brain. Okay, so that's it for today. I'll hang around for a little while in case there are any questions. Um, and as usual, I'll put everything on the web in a little while. Any question? No, thanks, Professor. Okay. Okay, bye. See you guys uh, next Monday.